I'm proud to introduce to you David Rosenberg, the convener of Cable Street 80, a proud anti-fascist and anti-racist who has stood against fascism and racism since the 1970s against the National Front and the British National Party right up to the present day of Britain first and the likes of Tommy Robinson. Over to you, David Rosenberg. So, I'm standing here 256 miles from Stockton in front of a mural in Cable Street in London's East End. The mural behind me is a celebration of courage, solidarity, unity and collective strength and an immense people's victory that took place here in 1936. And our two places, Stockton and Cable Street, are really not so far apart when we consider the spirit of anti-fascism that was present in both locations in the 1930s. I'll start with what happened here. On 4th of October 1936, Oswald Mosley, leader of the British Union of Fascists, was planning to make a show of strength by marching thousands of his uniformed, jack-booted fascist thugs in four columns through the heart of the Jewish immigrant area of the East End, where around 60,000 working-class Jews, tailors, shoemakers, cabinet makers, eked out a living in less than one square mile. The fascists gathered in a street called Royal Mint Street, not far from the Tower of London. Their route was supposed to go via Gardner's Corner, Allgate, where all the main streets of the City of London meet the streets of the East End, and then they would split into those four columns. But there was a mass blockade there by anti-fascists. How did that mass blockade get organised? Well, the week before Mosley's march, a local grassroots Jewish group, the Jewish People's Council Against Fascism and Anti-Semitism, took a petition to the Home Secretary calling for the march to be banned. Nearly 100,000 people 100,000 people signed it in just two days, Jew and non-Jew. But the Home Secretary recalled the important rights and liberties that Britain protected. The right to intimidate, threaten, abuse and attack immigrant populations, dressed up as free speech and free movement for Mosley and his fascists. And that was the important thing for the Home Secretary. It wasn't the freedom from attack of the community that was living here and he promised to send police down to make sure that the march could pass peacefully. But the Jewish People's Council had a plan B, and when the Home Secretary sided with Mosley, they quickly ran off another leaflet, calling on citizens of London, not just the Jews, to make sure the march did not take place. If the state won't ban it, the people will ban it. And that's what they did. Lots of different groups beyond the Jewish People's Council, the Communist Party, the Independent Labour Party, Labour League of Youth, the trade unions, and 7,000 police were mobilised. Mount, the mounted police charged at the demonstrators. They battered the protesters with truncheons, but they couldn't clear a path. And they advised Mosley that he would have to try and enter the East End further south. But the anti-fascists knew that if he couldn't get through at Allgate, then Cable Street was the next, next most likely point of entry. They built barricades in this narrow street, which at the time had shops on both sides of the road and two levels of tenement flats above. Who were the people of Cable Street? For the first two thirds of it, from near the city coming this way, they were mainly Jews. My grandfather's cousin, Harry, had a stationery shop at number 27, and Harry's family lived above it. Their shop was about 20 yards before the first barricade. And that first barricade was a turned over lorry. On the mural, you can see the wheel of that lorry. And you can see the furniture stacked up behind the barricades. The final third of Cable Street at that end was mainly Irish Catholic. And Mosley had tried very hard to win the Irish against the Jews. But the anti-fascist movement was bringing Jews and Irish together against Mosley. On the day, lots of Irish people, especially the most trade unionised ones, dockers and railway workers, came from their end of Cable Street to help the Jews build the barricades. In the mural, you can see the banners of the Communist Party and the Independent Labour Party, who were prominent fighting fascism throughout the 1930s. At one point, the police dislodged the first barricade. They didn't know there were other barricades behind, 
And as they ran through, they were trapped between the barricades. At that point, the women in the flats above rained down everything that, that was in their kitchens onto the police. Everything that you see flying through the air on the mural behind me came from oral histories of the women and men who were part of the battle that day. And on the mural, there is a woman with an egg who's wondering what to do with it. What with resistance from ground level and from above, the police were forced to retreat and they had to tell Mosley to go home and take his supporters with him. There were around 200,000 people on the streets of the East End that day. And if I was there at the time, I would have signed the petition to ban it. But in a way, I'm glad that the Home Secretary cared so little about the rights of people in this area that he didn't because he inadvertently brought about a bigger victory, a people's victory. Why did so many people come out that day? In a statement afterwards, Scotland Yard said they thought it was because of the weather. And it's a nice sunny day today. It was actually, though, because the working class communities of the East End had a history of decades of struggle for better lives. And they were used to coming out on the streets to protest, to march, to go on picket lines. For months and months in 1936, Mosley's fascists had been attacking and intimidating the Jews of the area. But people were organising to fight back and groups like the Jewish People's Council were holding meetings indoors and outdoors where they always had Jews and non-Jews on the same platform. What they were seeking to do then is what we have to do now, build an anti-racist and anti-fascist majority in our areas, in our communities, across the divides that our enemies are trying to build. Oswald Mosley's violent East London campaign began in late 1934 and was seriously in decline from 1937. But his movement began in 1932. And between 1932 and 34, he tried to build a movement around the whole country. At one point, they had 500 branches, and that included fascist groups in, in Newcastle, Sunderland, Gateshead, Durham, and Stockton. We have to recognise that 80 years ago, fascism won some support from every class of the population, including working people and unemployed. And as we head into a post-COVID economic crisis with rising unemployment, we know exactly what happens when you get unemployment, misery, hunger and poverty on such alarming levels. Mosley toured the country promising to rebuild Britain. He appealed to miners in the North East and South Wales, cotton workers in Lancashire, farmers in the South West, small shopkeepers in small towns and young people. The fascists told young people they were the only party who saw a role for young people in times of peace, not just as fodder in times of war. And that made a real impression. People remembered the First World War and it was recent history and the sacrifice made by young working class men. But when he came to the East End in 1934, that was because he had already been knocked back in various places around the country. And Stockton, full credit to you, your community was one of the first to recognise what Mosley was really all about. And um, behind that rhetoric, and you recognise whose interests he was really protecting. He was always for the millionaires like himself and not for the millions. And you took action to prevent him getting a foothold in, the, in your area. And it was the organisations of working people, trade unionists, who were at the heart of that uprising in Stockton to turf his foot soldiers out of your town. And you did that through united and determined action. You were an inspiration to anti-fascists elsewhere who took him on in Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds and here in London. Stockton was a battle. Cable Street was a battle. But the war against fascism in 1930s Britain was ultimately won not on the streets but on housing estates, especially in the East End, where anti-fascists helped set up tenants' defence committees to bring the communities that Mosley had tried to divide through hate, the Jews and the Irish, into a common fight for better housing. And the unity and solidarity that was forged then and there made it much harder for the fascists to get a hearing among them. We cannot deny that Mosley's movement had an appeal. 
but he could only manipulate people's consciousness when there was real anxiety about profound and pernicious social inequality in a society beset by mass unemployment, low pay, poor housing, poor access to education, neglect by those with power and wealth, widespread hopelessness, and a longing for personal and national salvation, if only such problems were confined safely to the past. But they're not. The fascists were beaten back in the 1930s, but they return now with new names and new flags. English Defence League, Britain First, For Britain, the Football Lads Alliance, National Action, and very recently, the Patriotic Alternative, the name, a name that sounds like the part erotic alternative. Well, they don't turn me on. And they are being fed and fattened and encouraged by our extreme right-wing government that has failed appallingly in the COVID crisis, has been responsible for tens of thousands of unnecessary deaths, especially amongst vulnerable ethnic minority and elderly populations with the least choices. And to cover for their failures, they're whipping up racist hysteria among, against some desperate asylum seekers arriving in dinghies on the Kent coast. If we are to stay true to the traditions of resistance that were established in Stockton and in Cable Street, we must not stand just against fascism, but every manifestation of racism and bigotry and authoritarianism that feeds it. And we need to work to strengthen a strong and permanent anti-racist and anti-fascist majority in our society. I want to finish with a memory of one of the 84 men and women, 79 of them anti-fascists, who were arrested on the day of the Battle of Cable Street. His name was Charlie Goodman. He was 21 years old, a young Jewish East Ender, at that time a member of the Labour League of Youth. At the police station, he was held horizontally by six policemen who used his head as a battering ram for the charge room door. He was in and out of consciousness, though he remembers the anti-Semitic abuse that the police were using to those who came in arrested. And when he was fully conscious again, he was aware that his jacket pocket was bulging and there were small rocks in there. He hadn't put them there, but they were used in evidence to convict him and jail him for three months. He was determined to continue the anti-fascist fight when he came out, and he did. And he did that by going to Spain and fighting in the International Brigade against Franco's fascists. He came back wounded, and this is another link between Cable Street and Stockton. You also had anti-fascists, local anti-fascists, like Johnny Longstaff, who fought for freedom and democracy in Spain. The slogan of the Spanish Civil War, no pasarán, was translated here as they shall not pass, and shouted here in Cable Street, they shall not pass. And every time we commemorate that battle, we say, they shall not pass. And in Cable Street and Stockton, they did not pass. Always anti-racist, always anti-fascist. Thank you.